I actually have a timer up here because I am all that's standing between us and a tiki party. And if I go over, I'm going to feel very, very bad. I have a title on here, and it's just going to be. Anyway, I'm Liz. This has been one of the most fun days I've had in a very long time, which maybe says more about me and my life than what we're going to be talking about today. Um, the irony being, you know, whenever someone with a PhD can't figure out how to work a projector system. So today, I'm warning you guys, I'm probably going to move around a lot. I'm probably going to get very excited. And we're going to talk about wonder and awe. I'm going to walk you through some huge mistakes I've probably made in my, my career. And I'm going to hopefully leave you with a sense of, well, you already know what you're doing here is spectacular. Hopefully today, when we go to the Tiki Party, you will have a little more perspective for how you can take those sparks of wonder and awe, take those sparks, figure out how to fan them with and turn them into embers and fan them to turn them into the flames that we're going to need if we're going to deliver, to deliver on a lot of these climate positive initiatives that we've been talking about. Um, I didn't actually have this slide in today. I figured I'd just come up here and not talk about myself because you guys really don't want to hear too much about me. But before I go into the weeds too much, I've done some really, really cool things in my life. I've been very, very fortunate growing up in a teeny tiny town in Alaska, these days living in Houston. Um, but one of the interactions that has had one of the largest impacts of my life was a day where I was a geologist in Hess Corporation, fresh out of my PhD in astrobiology, how someone with a PhD in astrobiology, specifically geomicrobiology, was working as a geologist in Hess Corporation is a whole other story. And someone named Moji came to talk about the work they were doing to pioneer genomics in the energy industry with biota. I'd never really thought that these, these startup companies that you hear about, like growing up in this tiny town in Alaska, I didn't really think that startup life was a thing. Um, and, and the captivation that Moji had and just the way he was talking about the things that were possible. Fast forward a few months later and I was working at a lab in San Diego. And long story, very, very short, I am really privileged to be able to offer the final keynote talk today. So I have this PhD in astrobiology. These days, I build data architectures and data platforms and lead a team of about 50 engineers, mostly in Scotland for Wood Mackenzie. So we're going to hop in our time machine, and we're going to go back in time to grad school. I went to Wisconsin-Madison, go Badgers, and I worked for the NASA Astrobiology Institute, looking at how microbial life evolved on early Earth and how that could be a proxy for life on Mars, specifically circumneutral pH microbial iron redox cycling. Um, and I think only three people fell asleep, which is the best reaction I've ever gotten from that. We're going to talk about a portion of this where I was looking at microbes that could oxidize pyrite. Pyrite, we actually have heard that word today already. We learned about calico pyrite. But pyrite is iron sulfide, FES2. Here it's a very pretty mineral like fool's gold, but it exists in a lot of other places. The reason I think iron is so important, aside from all the Iron Man jokes that can be made, is because iron is the most abundant redox sensitive element on the planet. If you don't know it, if you are not obsessed because of that, that's fine. But if you know what's going on with iron and you know what's happening with its solid and aqueous phase partitioning, you know what's happening. What could be happening on Mars, on Europa, on early Earth, and so I like to study, and I did spend a lot of time studying what was happening there. In acid mine drainage systems like this one, propagation of pyrite oxidation is one of the reactions that can often cause pyrite to turn into very low pH, very, very toxic systems. It can also happen in the subsurface. And by understanding the mechanisms by which that happens, we can unlock another pathway and really understand how that could be an important metabolism in early Earth. And we'll talk way more about this, and you guys are going to know more about iron than you ever thought possible. But I digress. Going back in time, I was a grad student at Wisconsin. I was working on one chapter of my dissertation, and I had these different cultures of microbes. They were being grown in these anaerobic test tubes. And I was exposing them to different collections of minerals and metastable mineral-like phases like iron monosulfide. But that's not important. The important thing is, You'd have microbes, you'd have minerals, you'd put them together, and you would see what happened. I decided I wanted to do this with pyrite and some other things to see if we could find 
we could learn more about what, would ha what was happening with pyrite oxidation. There are no known pyrite oxidizing microbes that can oxidize pyrite using oxygen at circumneutral pH. The reasons for that actually tie back into some of those very spaghetti-like diagrams we saw earlier. They have to do with EH and pH and things like that. So I decided I wanted to test this. Had a great plan. Step one, get some pyrite. You can't just go out and buy the kind of pyrite you want to make. I had to make it. I had to grow it in a lab. And the kind of pyrite I wanted wasn't pretty chunks like this. It was framboidal pyrite. These little raspberries are framboids of pyrite, because that's the kind that you would have in a sedimentary basin and you would have in the rock record. And so I found some references in the primary literature. I got some recipes. And as a, you know, fifth year grad student here, I obviously followed the recipes and made the pyrite exactly to the specifications, right? Wrong. I was like, I can do this better. I want to recreate the Archean Ocean. I want to add silica in here. I want to do things differently. The entire third and fourth floor of the geology building smelled like rotten eggs for three days. The fire department was called. I had to fill out a bunch of forms because pyrite, that, that S in the pyrite is sulfur, and when it's reduced, it smells like rotten eggs. The good news, though, is if you ever smell rotten eggs, the sulfide has not gotten high enough to be toxic to you. It's one of the most toxic gases ever. Turns out our fume hood wasn't calibrated correctly. Turns out I also didn't think to start any of these reactions in the fume hood. So lesson one, safety is very important. That's not the moral of this story. The moral of this story is that I made my pyrite, I had my reactors, I mixed them up, I was off to the races. I checked on them every week for two months, and nothing happened. So I put them on a shelf and forgot about them. And a few months later, it was lab clean-out day. I pulled them out, and it was like, OK, I have to do the dishes. These experiments failed. The thing that we don't tell you about, if you're not a scientist, is that the vast, vast, vast majority of your experiments actually fail. You come to have this masochistic tendency where you see failure is just another way that you're paying your due. So these experiments failed. I didn't want to wash the dishes, so I was like, I'll just take one more sampling point. And something strange happened. There was sulfate. The pyrite had somehow been oxidized significantly, and sulfate was there. Good news, I didn't have to do the dishes because something was happening. I could let them grow. So I transferred them over, checked on them a few weeks later. Faster, sulfate was produced again. What this means, if, if you're not a geomicrobiologist, is that that pyrite is oxidized into sulfate. The, the sulfide goes to sulfate. The fastest way to have that happen is having microbes catalyze the reaction. The layperson's explanation is microbes, pyrite, sulfate, something's happening. So I transferred it to another batch, and it happened. That's crazy. I assumed I made the pyrite wrong, but something happened. So I transferred it again, and it happened. And I transferred it again, and it happened again. At this point, I assumed either I'm making this pyrite wrong, which is probably more likely, or maybe we're onto something. Maybe this is one of the first times that I'm observing aerobic pyrite oxidation ever. Anyone's discovering it. As a fifth-year grad student who's been conditioned to love failure, that's obviously not what's happening. It's obviously that somehow the lab experiments are messed up, but I digress. Um, so I continued to grow these cultures and decided it was time to actually see if there was a there there. So I got some samples and went to, to look at them in a TEM, a transmission electron microscope. You take the sample, you put some electrons at it, and the idea is you go to the atomic level. And to do this, I got to work with our TEM expert. If you've ever spent time in TEMs, you spend hours in a cold room with very introverted, quiet people that don't like to talk a lot. I am none of those things. So after sitting together in the TEM room for four or five hours, not quite understanding what's going on, I have this sample of pyrite, the same pyrite I've been transferring, the same stuff that stunk up the building. And we put it under there, and he flashes a picture up on the screen. It is actually this picture. There's a five nanometer bar there for scale. This is FES2 or pyrite. And cool, there's something there. And I'm looking at it, and I asked this individual I've been sitting in silence with, that looks like Velcro to me. You know those repeating lines that you see across there? That looks like a textile, actually. What, what am I looking at here? What, what, am I, what am I seeing? Those are atoms. 
We are looking at the atoms from the chemicals I mixed in a lab, stunk up the lab, and now we're looking at the atomic structure. I'm getting goosebumps just thinking about that. This scientific moment took my breath away. And taking it one step farther, when you looked around the edges of those pyrite grains, there were thick domains like this where those atoms were messed up. The kind of amorphous iron oxide you see when a microbe is attached and starts to eat it. These look like biosignatures. Coupling chemicals in a lab to physically seeing something blew my mind. To take it a step further, there was some more interrogation to do. And, and really, the, the thing that sealed the deal, though, is I had access to a cryo-SEM. I spun down the sample. This could be abiological, it could be biological, but the proof is in the pudding. So we spun down a sample, got access to a cryo-SEM where you can slice thin images of it to see is it just a bunch of pyrite grains or are there microbial cells associated with it. The first image I saw from that cryo-SEM was this. These are pyrite framboids with microbes intimately associated with them. The first time a culture had been described capable of circumneutral pH microbial pyrite oxidation. We went on to sequence the genome. We found Rubisco genes. I did a bunch of clone libraries. This was a while back. Um, did some metagenomics on it. And it was a really cool scope of work. It actually went on to get published just a few years back, as academia goes. And in what has become one of my bucket list items ever since Tyra Banks told me it could be a bucket list item in the early days of America's Next Top Model, um, I got a cover out of this. The image actually made the cover of Geobiology. Now, I tee up this story for a few reasons. One is that safety is the most important thing you can do. Never jeopardize that. Um, the second thing here is that accidents will often lead to pretty incredible discoveries. This is not my big eureka moment when I think about my life. This is just something I did rank and file, becoming a scientist on my way that has been filed away. And when thinking about the things I wanted to talk about with wonder and awe, I keep really close to my heart as one of those moments that really just sparks joy and made me take a second look at the world around me. And the accidents of setting those, those test tubes on the bench because I didn't want to do the dishes and resampling them inadvertently led to what I think was one of the coolest discoveries of my graduate school career. If you're a scientist, or even if you're not a scientist, you probably have moments like this too. I want to encourage you to take the space to share them. If it's a LinkedIn post, that's awesome. We have a hashtag. We're going to get Moji as checkmark. I would love to be tagged in them, but make them part of your common day. When you have something that goes totally wrong too and it's a failure, normalize that. That's part of the scientific process. And even if it's just a moment of, I saw an atom for the first time of something where I combined chemicals to turn it into an atom of a mineral that is now stable. Celebrate that. So I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about the phylogenetic tree of life. I know, just when you thought this talk couldn't get any nerdier. This is a representation of how all life on Earth is related using DNA sequencing. This is not just microbes, so it is not just 16S. I actually have a necklace of this. Um, the first time I saw one of these trees of life, my mind was completely blown because I realized that our archaea are just totally different than everything else, and also that you could use techniques to see how things were related. Um, but also, I have an undergrad degree in geology, and there's, there's two things I want to share with you about my degree in geology so that you too can pretty much become a geologist. One is that water is a powerful force. Water is the reason we have mountains and plate tectonics. It's the closest thing we have to a universal solvent. It's a lot of people think why life originated on Earth. Um, and two, geologic time is insane. This phylogenetic tree, all the life we know now, is not how Earth always looked. For every single branch you see there, you can go back in time, and at any given point, a different tree emerged from there. It's these mass extinction events and these, these normalization events that give us the tree we have today. 
Now, you may think, okay, time, geologic time. Okay, I kind of get that, but no. The Earth is old, like really, really, really old. It is 4.6 billion years old. Quick analogy, this one's my favorite. Converting the age of the Earth to how tall I am, I'm five foot 10, but for the sake of math, we'll say I'm about two meters. If this is 22 million years old, Earth would be cooling down at the bottom of my feet. Life would evolve around my knees. Microbial life, thank you very much. Multicellular life's evolving up here. So microbes have been around a very long time, which is why they have these really cool gene cassettes and metabolic pathways. Dinosaurs evolve somewhere in here. They die out here. Us humans, all of the great advances of humanity, everything from our art to our culture to the things that make us great. The width of a single hair on the top of your head. That is all of humanity when you think about it, all of humanity. Now, connecting it to the atoms that I, that I talked about earlier, these atoms are less than a nanometer in diameter, and a human hair, as we learned about earlier, thank you, Marnie, I also know that rocks have to be crushed to this diameter, um, are around 100 microns on average. Comparing those two numbers, that's around a five order of magnitude increase. If we take the, the difference between that atom and that little piece of hair, and we continue that up, just have this quick thought experiment with me, we continue that up and multiply it by 100,000, we get 10 meters. That's how high sea levels were during the last interglacial. Temperatures on Earth were 2.1 degrees hotter during that time. The same temperatures that are predicted to happen in the year 2100 if nothing happens. It's not saying that sea levels will be 10 meters higher. There's a lot of stochasticity and inherent differences with sea level modeling. But climate change is real, as we talked about earlier. And humanity is so, so tiny. We are talking about the width of a single hair. As we go about our day-to-day -day jobs, and I'm looking at most of you with Samvita shirts on, as you in particular, and we as a human species go about our day-to-day -day jobs, think about how what you do is brutally, brutally almost impossible. I know that's not very optimistic. You are less than an atom on this piece of hair, and you are trying to impact climate in a way that will have a lasting mark in an Earth that is very, very old. I would argue that that is one of the most noble causes a human could undertake, but at the same time, it is also one of the most difficult causes. The deck is absolutely stacked against you in many ways socially, in many ways politically, science is stacked against you, experiments fail. And just to be realistic, like it's gonna be really, really, really hard. Hard things can be really fun though, which is where this talk will eventually go, do not fear. But I just wanna put it in context. Our time here is so, so brief, which is why it's truly a privilege that everyone is listening to me speak for part of that. But our impact is so tall, so small, and what we're trying to do is create an impact that could be so tall, even if it's just the diameter of two or three additional hairs. So our time is fleeting. It really is a privilege to be able to impact the future. And I, I mean that at a cellular and atomic level. And the time to do that's now. So last little chapter in the story. I'm at 18 minutes. We're doing really well. Um, I want to shift gears a little bit. I have the most awkward selfie I could find of my time at AWS. Prior to this role, I was a solutions architect at AWS. It was probably the most fun job I've ever had working for this the world's biggest startup. Um, I got to play, I got to go all over and talk to customers all around the world about whatever they wanted to talk about. As a technologist, I was so ready to talk to customers about high performance computing, about the scalability of S3, about crazy technology things, artificial intelligence, machine learning. You want to talk in depth about semantic segmentation? Yes, let's do it. What do you think 95% of customers really wanted to talk about? Hint, it wasn't the technology, it was the culture. It was the weird, quirky stuff you read about that Amazon does. It was, do you really have two pizza teams? 
yes, we do. Do you really ban PowerPoint internally and just write long papers? Yeah, for the most part, if you can't write it in a paper, you haven't thought it through well enough. It was the working backwards process. It was everything about the team structure. It was, do you raise the bar? Do you really believe in the leadership principles? And like, yes, to this day, I still do. It was these pieces of the culture that make Amazon as a company unique. Amazon is one example. I'll use it because it was absolutely pivotal to how I've run my teams and do it now. And it was the first time I really could grok what culture meant. Why does that matter to any of these pieces? Because culture, in many ways, is what impacts the community you build. And community is the single most important thing you will have. I would argue for the sake of this talk, you can use culture and community interchangeably. But community, your coworkers, the fact that apparently some of you have been conditioned when your name is called to just be reflexive and be ready to catch a ball, because that's a, that's a thing, looking at you. This is how we do it, apparently. Um, those moments that make you laugh and make work coming, make coming into work fun. The times that I know at Biota when we were having shit days where our experiments would fail or we would have really high background in our PCR and I was working with Heather and Victoria at the time and we would just have to cancel everything and we would just go to a bottle shop down the street at like two in the afternoon and I would just buy around and we would just commiserate. Those were honestly some of the most fun afternoons, and we would wax and wane and think philosophically. Again, life is really short, and the community is kind of like a garden. A lot of these ideas are gonna be seeds. I'm mixing a lot of metaphors here. A lot of the people individually are also gonna be seeds, but think about how you wanna tend it and how you wanna grow it. Because in many ways, it's up to the dynamic duo of leadership over here to set the tone for the company and the culture, but that can only go so far. How you celebrate success and how you show up to the office and how you stay at home from the office and how you decide to be, that's up to you. That, I would argue, is the most important part. Why? I'm about to tie it all together in my last slide. Let's go on this journey together. Wonder and awe ignite a spark. Seeing Adams ignites that spark for me realizing that I had discovered something no other scientist had ever discovered ignites a spark. Right now, building a data platform and a new way to get data over, that, is, that brings me joy, that little tiny spark of enthusiasm. To leave a mark on a planet, though, to go from your teeny tiny bit of hair to something that's going to outlive all of us and make the world better, that is nearly impossible. You need to take those sparks that you get, though, and you need to kindle them with the engagement and the compassion that you get from the communities that you build. That's how you're gonna take those sparks and you're going to ignite them, and you're going to fuel them, and you're going to figure out how to go from spark to teeny tiny embers to full, full fires because only then will you have enough sustainability to bring more people into the mix to actually create the innovation that, that we need and that as global citizens of the planet, we're counting on you all. So with that, thank you for your time and let's go ahead and wrap up this fantastic day.